Thank you, John. Uh, <clears throat> it's a real pleasure today to introduce Chris Westfall. He is an expert on MOOCs, and I know we're all sort of wondering what's a MOOC. We're about to find out what a MOOC is. He's also a national elevator pitch champion, uh, which I can tell you is sort of like the uh, uh, winning the gold in the Olympics of uh, entrepreneurial talk. And he's author of the new elevator pitch. We actually have some of his books uh, on the back table. If afterwards, if you're interested in purchasing any, Chris is here and he'll be uh, around to sign them as well. His strategies have created uh, multi-million dollar revenue streams across a very wide array of industries around the globe. And he's nationally recognized as an expert on marketing, branding, and leadership. He's the publisher of The Millennial CEO by Daniel Newman. And he received his undergrad degree from Southern Methodist University his MBA from Texas Christian University, and he's originally from our neighbor to the south, Chicago, and now he resides in Dallas with his wife and two daughters. Welcome, Chris, and let's hear more about MOOCs. Thank you very much, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome. Let me start off by asking a quick question. What would it mean to you and your business and your academic institution if schools like Harvard and Stanford and MIT began offering open enrollment, courses that didn't cost any money and took the approach, come one, come all. This is the world of the massive open online course. This is the world that we enter into for our discussion today, a new world of accessibility, a new world of technological initiatives, and a world that is transforming the way that education is delivered at some of the most revered institutions in the United States. And of course, I'm talking about Marquette Cardinal Stritch and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Okay, let's get started by beginning our conversation by looking at what Forbes calls a $1 trillion Opportunity. Are you familiar with this article? It's about Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy. He is the first rock star educator in this space with over 10 million students. Today we're going to learn about what a MOOC is. We're going to learn about what a MOOC is, talk about why MOOCs matter, and how do these strategies impact learning, not only from an academic perspective, but from a student's perspective, from the perspective of lifelong learning, and ultimately, from the perspective of the business model. What is the business model? What are the drivers behind massive open online courses? Sound like a plan? All right. Massive open online courses feature a few things that differentiate them from distance learning or some of the things that you may have been familiar with in the past. Massive open online courses are more than just video curriculums or videotapes of lectures. However, Massive open online courses are based in the video format. So lectures, teaching, placed on video, provided to students in a platform that allows for tracking of mouse clicks, interactive quizzes, and an ability to understand through data mining where students are struggling. For example, educators now can find out that at minute 14 of the video, a high proportion of students drop out. Why? Educators can now learn that students are struggling with a particular type of problem in a mathematics course, which if I turn in an assignment to you, you don't know how much I struggled or how many times I tried before I got that problem right. But if I'm doing it online and you're tracking my mouse clicks, you have an opportunity to laser focus your teaching. How do you create that focus within a massive online community that's part of the magic, and the answer to that question is still under development, but we'll touch on that as we look at some of the future trends that we see being developed. Some of the key elements that also need to be addressed within the understanding of massive open online courses is that they focus on competency. Traditionally in education, the focus is on the degree, and the degree is delivered through coursework. But for massive open online courses, competency derived through certifications is where the market is headed. For example, if you have a student who comes to you from a university and says, I have a bachelor's degree in Spanish, I'd like to work for you, what's the first thing you do? After you congratulate them, you give them a test to see if they can speak Spanish. 
So competency, testing, the ability to establish your capabilities as a solutions provider is key to the MOOC model. And we already have those sorts of certifications with the JD degree. You've got to pass the bar exam to be a lawyer, the CPA certification. But what is being suggested and actually what is coming down the pike in this marketplace is a greater need for certifications. And academic institutions, because of the cachet and the branding that they already enjoy, are uniquely poised to provide that sort of stamp of approval and those kinds of certifications. Because what employers want, and for those of you that represent businesses here in the audience, what I would suggest that all employers want are solutions providers, people who can solve problems with particular skill sets. And while we may think that a degree from institution A may carry more weight than institution B, the reality is that the students should be evaluated based on their own merit and their own capabilities, not simply on the cachet or the branding of the university. Because I've met some folks from Ivy League universities that aren't particularly impressive, and I'm sure you have too. So capabilities go beyond simply the cachet or the name of the university. And that's what MOOCs are all about, is about providing that sort of learning. They're targeted ideally at the ambitious student, the student who is looking for simply to gain the knowledge and acquire the skill set, not necessarily to have that sort of on-campus experience, which you can't possibly duplicate online. But that is attracting students in enormous numbers classes of over 100,000 students are not uncommon. How do you manage that kind of environment? How do you create a meaningful way to assure quality, assure one-on-one -on -one instruction, make sure that people aren't cheating? Those are some of the questions that MOOCs have to answer today. Let me give you a little bit of an origin story to make you aware, if you're not, of where MOOCs actually started. The idea of the MOOC came to be at Stanford University in 2011, Stanford University in 2011, when Sebastian Thrun launched a course on artificial intelligence, an artificial intelligence course which was launched for free, come one, come all, no vetting, no admissions policy, whoever you are, if you'd like to come and take this course, you could. He also charged 200 paying students at Stanford to take the course, but here's what happened. 160,000 people signed up, 160,000. And get this, 23,000 actually completed the course. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, Chris, that's a pretty low number. But picture this, if Stanford offered open enrollment and people said, you know what? I feel pretty strong, I think I could take a class at Stanford. Well, <laughs> the reality of that, and the numbers bear it out, it's not necessarily true. Now, I'm not saying that the people who dropped out were not accomplished or didn't have the skill set to complete it. Perhaps they had other things pulling on their time. And since the course was free, the amount of their investment and desire to complete the course also impacted. But the fact remains that 23,000 people took this online course. As a result, Sebastian quit Stanford University and formed a company called Udacity, one of the leaders in the MOOC space. And we'll talk a little bit later today about some of the thought leaders in, in this area and in this arena. And some of those thought leaders are here, in fact, in the room and they'll be talking on the panel later today. Here's another quote that I think is very interesting and it gives you some insight into why people are forming these MOOCs. This is Andrew Ng. He is one of the, formers, uh, the founders excuse me, of Co Coursera. Coursera, one of the leaders in the space, and you can see right there on the screen, he wanted to make a Stanford education available to people who couldn't afford to come to Stanford. In this environment of lifelong learners, the idea that a college sophomore is 19 or 20 years old is simply outdated. That college sophomore could be a 37-year-old mother of two who would love to access the information that they provide in Palo Alto or right here in Milwaukee, but she can't make it from Two Rivers into the city because she has other obligations. Why not make it available to her? Why not make education available to the masses? At least that's the mindset behind MOOCs. And MOOCs exist at the intersection of these ambitions and technology, the enablers that allow us to create this kind of environment. And it's it's very, very exciting, and the implications are huge, both for learners and for the community at large. Because what our companies here in the Milwaukee area and across the United States, across the state of Wisconsin, what they look for 
are the kinds of solutions, the kind of competency that can only come from that traditional university environment. And yet, in the traditional university environment, we're seeing a lot of new entrants. We're seeing for-profit universities growing in their numbers. We're seeing new alternatives. Why? Because in the information economy, information is the currency. You have to have access to the skills to play in the new economy. So that's why we see new entrants coming into the market and new opportunities as well. Because at the very base, I think you will all agree that colleges are in the business of many things, but they're in the business of developing critical thinking skills. Wouldn't you agree? And if you think about it, I mean, if I, if I had a time machine and I could bring back a police officer from 100 years ago, a police officer, just imagine, if you will, that I could bring back to, to the present day a police officer from 1913, that police officer would be completely confused by the tools he was expected to use to do his job. It would be completely confusing to him. And there are a number of other occupations that would be confusing as well from 100 years ago. However, that professor of Renaissance history from 1913 would feel perfectly at home in the classroom of today. Now, you may argue that there are new technologies and that sort of thing, but the idea of the sage on the stage, that lecture hall environment, you know what I'm talking about, it hasn't changed in 100 years. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well. You know, let's set that to the side, and I'll leave it to the panel to take sides. It's a thing. It's a reality. And another reality is that we have new technologies and new expectations from our students. We have new expectations from the workforce community that are driving us to add to critical thinking skills. So for the companies that are represented here today, the great companies that are here based in Milwaukee and in the state of Wisconsin, how do we unite those critical thinking skills with a modern message that creates the kind of relevance that businesses and students expect? It's about unifying the product that we have and the promise of the university degree in a way that meets expectations. And those expectations are what are transforming the academic institution and transforming them through MOOCs. Some of the defining factors in MOOCs is probably not a secret to the folks in this room, but of course, you know that the only cost in the United States that's risen more than healthcare over the last 10 years is the cost of a college education. Now, before that makes you shut down, let, okay, all right, I thought that would work. When I rehearsed it, it was funny to me. Anyway. Before, see, I told, I told you, I said, I'll, okay, he liked it. He was like, how many jokes are you going to have? I said, I don't know, that's up to you. Education costs have risen 84% since 2000. The cost of education is going up. Why? Because people want it. People are willing to pay more. People are willing to pay for for-profit universities. In fact, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, charges more to take their course online. Yeah, if you want to take finance in your pajamas, it costs you more. Convenience, convenience. Another defining factor is the shape of the classroom. It, it looks something like this, and you see it up there on the screen. The devices that students carry today, and that's not a comment about the age of the students. I'm talking about all of us at every age having access to the new kind of classroom. And I was asked about the, the digital divide in our conversation this morning, the digital divide, access to these kinds of devices. Look at this statistic. Student tablet ownership in the United States, it's up 257%. And there are tablets on the market today that have a sub-100, even a sub-$50 price point on the market in the United States. So the question really for universities is, are students the product or the customer in this new environment? And that's the question that MOOCs are asking. And depending on where you line up on that issue, will color the way that you approach MOOCs and approach your interest and appetite for this new initiative. One of the things that's important to understand, and you'll hear this talked about if you uh, look at MOOCs at all, is this concept of flipping the classroom, flipping the classroom. And here's what that means. In a traditional classroom, you've got the sage on the stage, as I said before. It's that idea that you come to class for the lecture, and you go away to do your work, to apply. Flipping the classroom means that lectures are the homework. You watch them online. The lectures are the homework. The actual activity, problem-solving tasks. That's what's done in a MOOC. And this idea of a 50-minute lecture or a 90-minute
lecture or even a three-hour course is completely exploded online as they create shorter and shorter ways for people to access information. Why? Because when we make progress quickly and receive rewards for that progress, we are more motivated to learn. At least that's the theory that's put forward by Daniel Pink in his book. And I believe that it's something that has been adopted very successfully for MOOCs as they've shortened that, that sort of problem-solving time and provided elements of gamification to reward students. Gamification is rewarding badges and that sort of thing for your progress. For example, uh, on the Khan Academy, you get an award. You get recognition, electronically, of course, but recognition nonetheless for persistence and those sorts of things. And if you say, well, that, that seems kind of silly. Where does that come from? I would like to challenge you to a video game, if that's your perspective, because I think I would win. It comes from the world of video games. So that's the way that students are used to learning. Finally, effective teaching. What does effective teaching really mean? If you want to know if a professor is effective, don't look at what they're saying. Look at what the students are doing. What are the students doing? And what are the students doing in the MOOC? In a massive online open course, you have a granularity through big data and some of the other initiatives and the technology that exists to see at a granular level what people are doing with the work that they've been assigned. It's a very, very powerful tool, and it creates a greater connection between what the workforce wants and what students can deliver by offering that competency, that certification. So where are we now? Here's a little bit of information. And by the way, if you're interested in receiving a copy of these slides, there'll be information at the end of the presentation so that you can access them. And I'm happy to provide them as well as a bibliography, information of these sources that I've used to create this presentation. But this slide introduces you to some of the key players in the MOOC space, Udacity, who I mentioned before, Coursera, who now has 4 million registered students and recently received $43 million in venture capital funding. Venture capital firms in Silicon Valley and elsewhere are taking notice of the power of the MOOCs. And while the monetization model is still being developed, picture this. What about for our friends at the Khan Academy? Khan Academy, 10 million students. Remember, the MOOC is free, so come one, come all. But if you'd like to get certification from the Khan Academy, in other words, if you'd like the chance to get a credential, that credential will be $20 and 25% of their student population, that's 2.5 million people, takes you up on that offer. Is that a compelling revenue stream? That's just one course. So venture capitalists are taking notice of the potential here. And the ability to provide that sort of certification, that sort of credibility, is key to making the MOOC business model work. If you see there in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, that is actually a picture of me and my friend Jeffrey Hazlett, who is the newest contributing editor on Bloomberg TV. And we have actually produced a course, our own little MOOC, uh, if you will, on Udemy, which is a platform that is, uh, in, in many cases, a free platform, but in our case, a pay-to-play platform. But Udemy received $12 million in venture capital funding as well. So again, there's an opportunity in this economy for expertise. Expertise and your ability to share that expertise is something that people are hungry for. And the method is the MOOC. Here's a quote that I like from the founder of Udacity, and it's, it's on the Udacity website. I'll just share it with you real quick. Education is no longer a one-time event, but a lifelong experience. Wouldn't you agree? Education should empower students to succeed, not just in school, but in life. It's not about passive listening. It's about active doing. Here's what Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, says. And this is what he said in his, his Forbes interview. What I did by cutting classes was manage to get two undergraduate degrees and a master's in four years. There were much more productive ways of learning than sitting in lectures. Sal Khan created YouTube videos for a cousin who was living in Boston. He was living in New Orleans at the time. And he wanted to help her with her math problems. So he created these videos and put them on YouTube and opened them up and found that he was getting 10,000 hits a day. And he received a letter, an email from a, someone who had seen his videos. And it said, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically, I didn't think I would be able to get into college for my chosen major for math. But by watching your videos, it, it made a huge difference. And I just wanted you to know that not only am I in the program of my choice, but I've also been awarded a scholarship. And so, he saw the power of this online teaching tool, and he harnessed it. And you can see that by thinking of things in new and innovative ways, he was able to accomplish far more than the average student. And he did 
what he accomplished at Harvard University, which is, I think, very impressive. So some of the things that you have to think about is, of course, there's no substitute for the college experience. There is no substitute for the things that make up that college experience. And for students who are just out of high school, going to college and maturing over those four years can be an important part of their personal development. But at the same time, you also have a student population who is more interested in learning. And so more, more interested in learning, excuse me, than the actual experience. And the social aspect of college, which can be so important, and, and the social aspect of learning now is really the social network aspect of learning as we think about the way that students today converse and communicate. So MOOCs fits within this very nicely. We've talked about the cost of convenience, but it's about creating material that's designed for the way that people work, live, and learn today. Finally, I want to share with you, and in conclusion, as I bring my remarks to an end, I want to share with you some resources. And the first one is my friend right there. That's Jose Bowen. And for those of you that are readers or looking for additional resources, Jose Bowen is the author of Teaching Naked. It's a best-selling book in the education category, and it formed the basis for many of the remarks that I made today. I spoke with uh, Jose in preparation for today's talk, and I'm, I'm a big fan. He is the dean of the Meadows School of the Arts at Southern Methodist University, and I'm a big fan of his work, so I wanted to share that with you. You can also find out more about things like what Yale is doing with their open online courses. Yale University has dipped their toe into this, into this pond in a big way, and they've created a series of YouTube videos on a number of different subjects. And even our friends at Deloitte have created a corporate initiative. This is IFRS, this is International Financial Reporting Standards. This is a course, a massive open online course that's been created by Deloitte and has been taken by people in over 190 countries. So we see crossover for the MOOC model, not just in academic institutions, but also in corporations. And then finally, someone who I find fascinating to read and actually a little scary is Sherry Turkle, the MIT professor who wrote this book, Alone Together. And if you can see the subtitle, it's Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other. It's a fascinating read and something that I'd encourage you to look at if you'd like to know more. Finally, if you're wondering what the big question is for MOOCs, well, you know, first one is, are you ready for your close-up? But really, the thing that is being defined in this greenfield opportunity is the question that you see on the screen next. Who will lead us? The marketplace is hungry for new ways of accessing the kind of knowledge that educational institutions have provided for hundreds of years. The question is, who will lead us? And how will you and your organization or your company take a leadership role in this new and very exciting platform helps people in so many ways in the spirit of sharing, but also in a very interesting business model as well. Finally, I want to thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to connect with you. And if you'd like the conversation to continue, I want to share with you some additional resources. You can reach out to me via my website, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of these slides. You can also find me on your favorite social network. I've created a YouTube channel myself with over 110 different videos that talk about some of the key elements of my platform. And I'd like to invite you to check that out at Westfall Online and on the YouTube channel. And also, that's my website, Westfall Online. I've got about 12,000 followers on Twitter, and you can find me there. And if you'd like to check out the 118 Pitch Course, which is the course that I created with Jeffrey Hazlett, you can find that at bit.ly forward slash go 118. Milwaukee. My name is Chris Westfall. Thanks very much for allowing me to share with you some ideas on MOOCs. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> as, as we're talking about what this means for universities, for lifelong learning, for corporations, uh, we wanted to have a chance to have some of our uh, local uh, leadership in the, uh, in the college and university area respond, as well as Chris. And so um, we also reached out to uh, John Raymond, who is the uh, president and CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin, to moderate today's panel. Uh, Dr. Raymond's a practicing neurologist, also known as a stone doctor, right? OK, all right. <laughs> Uh, who plays active roles in clinical care, teaching, and faculty mentorship, and he's also a medical researcher. Um, he serves on the editorial boards of many respected publications. He's very active in scientific peer review. 
He's received many honors and awards for excellence in leadership, diversity, mentorship, research, teaching, and clinical care. But most importantly, currently under his leadership, Medical College is working on an online medical program with Arizona State and Mayo Clinic. So welcome, John. Julia. Um, I'll be moderating today's panel on MOOCs and their impact on our educational system. All have experience with MOOCs or online courses and the increase of these programs in the university atmosphere. As I read your name, I'd like to invite you to come up. Chris, if you could come back up, that would be great. Often. Their education experience, and in his time at Stritch, has guided the university through a comprehensive visioning and planning process for long-term growth of the institution. Before his time at Cardinal Stritch, Jamie served as Vice President of Enrollment Management and Student Services at St. Ambrose University in Davenport, Iowa. He holds a doctorate in Planning, Policy, and Leadership Studies from the University of Iowa, an MBA from the University of Notre Dame, and a Bachelor of Arts Psychology from Notre Dame, and it's okay. Dr. Loftus once rode his bike across the country and has run two marathons. Long time ago. <laughs> so it is a small that for a small world story. Our next panelist is University of Wisconsin Milwaukee Chancellor Mike Lovell. Mike, if you could come up. Before serving as Chancellor, Mike was Dean of the College of Engineering and Applied Science and a Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. He's been named a State of Wisconsin Distinguished Professor and helped form the Wisconsin Energy Resource, uh, Research Consortium. Mike also assisted in the loss of the ANSYS Institute for Industrial Innovation. He holds three academic degrees in mechanical engineering, including a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome, Chancellor Lovell. He's also a marathon runner. Our final panelist is Mount Mary University President Eileen Schwalbach. Dr. Schwalbach began her career at Mount Mary in 1993 as a professor and director of the graduate program in education. Before coming to Mount Mary, Eileen taught in MPS for 25 years. She's very active in the community, particularly on education initiatives, and serves on multiple boards of Milwaukee <clears throat> in Milwaukee area, including Milwaukee Succeeds, PAVE, Milwaukee Achiever Literacy Services, and more. She received her bachelor's in English from Marquette and her master's in English and PhD in urban education from UWM. She received the 2009 Legacy Award from Milwaukee Achiever Literacy Services and a Woman of Influence Community Supporter Award from the Business Journal. Welcome, Eileen. We'll start with a few questions uh, that I'll invite each of the panelists to answer individually. And then we'll open it up to Q&A for the whole membership a little bit after 1 o'clock. So I'd like to start by asking, uh, what new modes of course delivery is your institution planning to do now or in the future? If we could start with Eileen. Well, when I was listening to Chris talk about the um, sage on the stage, I thought, well, that doesn't sound like Mount Mary, because our average class size is 13. And so our classes are discussions among students and, and faculty members. But I think that, um, that MOOCs do offer an amazing opportunity for our students to be taught by some of the best professors around, around the world. So I think that that's um, an interesting venue for us to explore. But in terms of our own delivery system, we are exploring online courses. We have a doctorate in art therapy, which is um, predominantly online. Students come to Mount Mary during the summer, and then they go back to wherever they, they are living and working, and then they take classes. And we find that kind of blended or hybrid program really fits the kind of students that we have at Mount Mary. Uh, we, in our masters in occupational therapy also, we have a similar program where students come 
and spend some time on campus, but then they do most of their work off-site. So, so we're looking at online, we're looking at um, how we might expand those offerings for students. Thanks very much, Eileen. Mike? Uh, well, first, I, I just want to start by saying that uh, we have been teaching online courses at UWM for over a decade. Uh, we were the first institution in the state to do so, and we have more online courses than any other university in the state. So one in four of our students currently enrolled take at least one online course. So it's something that's part of kind of the DNA of, of who we have been over the last 10 years. And so when we think about what MOOCs are, for those of you in the business world, it's really a disruptive innovation in our space. And so we have to figure out what we're going to do, because it takes time to shake things out. And because um, what's happening is, you know, as, as Chris pointed out, you're decoupling the content of courses from the accreditation or how you give credits for them. And so in, in this world, particularly at a university like UWM, you really have to define Destiny. You want to be a leader, as Chris pointed out. You want to be a leader. You want to be a follower, follower because you may come, become irrelevant. And so when this all started happening last, um, uh, last winter, uh, I, I challenged the campus uh, to come up with a new model uh, that we could take advantage of this opportunity that's been presented to us. And um, I'm very proud to say that the, the faculty actually came back and uh, we have something we're rolling out this fall. It's called a flexible option. And it is the first competency-based degree program in the country. Uh, President Obama uh, talked about it about two and a half weeks ago in, a, in Buffalo. And why it's different than the MOOCs is we're actually charging for the courses. So you, you pay a lower rate, but you can get actually get uh, co uh, credits for your life skills. So we're doing the competencies. You still have to take 32 credits you know, on the campus at some point, but you could, that may be all you'd have to take. And the reason why this is so important uh, is the fact that even just looking at the state of Wisconsin, there are 750,000 residents in our state that have some college experience without a degree. That's our market. That's who we need to go after. Uh, if you think about the demographics in the whole Midwest, our population base of high school graduates is going down. The only place they're going up is in the Sun Belt, and it's pretty hard to recruit students from Florida or Arizona to Milwaukee. So, so this is something we're going for. So we're really going to be, we already have four uh, programs we're rolling out in the flex option. Uh, we're looking at adding simply number more going forward. And it's really just a, a, a new way that we are taking advantage of this disruptive technology and the wave of the future. And as uh, the rest of the country figures out how MOOCs, uh, what the financial model are for MOOCs, we're offering you know, a flex option that is online competency based here, here in the state. And so I'm very excited about uh, where we are and where we're going with this. Thank you, Mike. Now if we could hear from uh, Jamie Loftus about Cardinal Stritch. Thanks, John. Um, we're also expanding our online offerings, uh, grown by 80% in the last uh, two years, fundamentally in the education area, although we're looking very closely at uh, expanding in our health sciences component. Um, you've got a great book out, uh, The New Elevator Pitch. Uh, our elevator pitch, I think it's Stritch as small as beautiful. Um, so we're uh, looking at a concept called SPOX, um, and I'm not a Trekkie, but uh, <laughs> small private online courses, which I think affirms um, some of Stritch's strengths in the marketplace, and that is personalization, uh, time with faculty. Uh, we're supportive of the concept of MOOCs. Uh, the notion of learning uh, principally is a great thing, uh, but to be able to move that into some co competency-based uh, understanding I think are, are where our challenges uh, lie. But, uh, um, so we're, we're asking our faculty to consider these smaller units of online learning. And again, uh, a concept also uh, motivated by Harvard and Berkeley is this idea of SPOCs, uh, the small private online courses. So that's, that's kind of the trend uh, that we think we're headed. Great. I'm going to ask a more provocative question and leave this open to any of you that want to answer. Are MOOCs a threat or an opportunity for your institution? Well, again, I would just offer, I think, both, frankly. Um, you know, Stritch's uh, brand is not uh, uh, beyond the Midwest. So the idea of going up against the Berkeleys and the Harvards of the world uh, gives us some pause. On the other hand, it's a great opportunity, um, particularly, as I see it, uh, in our advancement in the alumni relations area. I mean, what a great opportunity for us to advance this notion of lifelong learning. So I think that's a real venue for us. And fundamentally, I think the idea of the MOOCs is this notion of engagement. 
Um, and in advancement, the more engaged you are, uh, the more donors, the more support you have. So uh, it, it's uh, something we have to look at as a very positive uh, for Stretch. But frankly, yeah, certainly some threat with uh, the big time players um, uh, having the ability to uh, brand themselves uh, pretty aggressively. When I talk to potential students about Mount Mary, I always talk about fit. So Mount Mary wouldn't be a good fit for, for every student. But I think the same thing is true about Moon. It's going to be a, um, a really great way to get access to, to great minds. But is everybody going to want to take a course with 100,000 people? The, the, um, the drive, the perseverance. Um, some people need more social support. So, so I think there's a place for all of us in the educational landscape. So I really don't see MOOCs as a threat, but, but an opportunity to meet the needs of some students. But I think there will be a role here to have It's well, about options. Good. Is it's, it's about options. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that we spoke about at breakfast today, and it kind of piggybacks on, on Jamie's remarks, is this idea of lifelong learning. If you have a particular skill set, particularly, for example, in medicine, where technology changes and the way that a procedure is done changes, what the MOOC model allows you to do is, if you have that connection and that, that branding with students for life, they know that they can go back to you as a resource for those changes. So th that availability and that, that consistency creates, I think, an even more powerful brand, and particularly for smaller colleges that have unique solutions, that that branding is so vital. And I think you've done a, a great job, if I, you know, as, as a branding guy, you've done a great job of capturing w what that brand is and your ability to express it to the students and deliver on it. It's, it's about options. Why wouldn't? this online platform be an option that you would explore, from, from my perspective? Mm -hmm. I would just say, obviously, when you have a paradigm shift in your space, in that being higher education, there's always a threat that you may make a wrong decision and be left behind, as I mentioned before. But when you think about the raw numbers and the opportunity that we have, you know, we talk on, at UWM, we have 30,000 students on our campus. We could very easily have 100,000 students online. Uh, that would be taking classes uh, that would be paying for them. So it really does present an opportunity for us. But I think we all should really be cognizant of the fact that the big winner here is going to be the students. You know, they're the winners. They're, they're um, the consumers of this. They're going to have more access to courses. Uh, they're going to be at a lower cost. And I can just tell you, the, um, even when I was teaching uh, a decade or so ago, when I was teaching in the classroom, uh, this whole movement actually started by MIT probably about 12 or 13 years ago, when they started putting all of their course content uh, online for free, not, the, not videos, but they actually put all the PowerPoint slides and material using the courses. And as an engineering professor, I was teaching product innovation, and there was uh, two really famous uh, innovation professors at MIT called Albrecht and Eppinger. I was able to go and download all of their material, and I used a lot of that material in my own class. So the students were actually getting a better experience because MIT, in my class, because MIT was putting their courses on for free. So you can imagine how we could potentially utilize MOOCs and other courses that other classes teach to supplement information we have. So it really is, a, it, I think we all students, but are also going to give them access to things they might not get at other institutions. I, I think what Mike said, if I could just piggyback on that, is, is really about content creation. I mean, why wouldn't you use the information from recognized experts in the field, and professors have been doing that for years, because it's really about helping students to know where to look. It's really about what you can create or reinvent the wheel, but it's about providing them with access to those resources and then the ability to concentrate in the smaller class sizes or whatever the case may be on those higher order thinking skills once they have that basis of knowledge. And that's what, that's also part of the MOOC model is providing those kinds of resources in new ways. And I think that we will see colleges uh, adopt and adapt to that. Is it, is it a threat or is it just simply an extension of the kind of content curation that's going on now? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think as education providers, uh, MOOCs have been called this notion of a digital tsunami. Well, it's far more than a passing storm. And 
uh, we not only must adapt, we want to adapt uh, to provide this notion of options, different vehicles for learning, and then have some confidence that the learning is relevant and can be applied to uh, the skill set that they're seeking. So um, it, adaptivity is, uh, is really, I think, the next step. Can I ask if anyone thinks that there may be discipline-specific penetration of MOOCs? So, for example, in medical education, you could foresee a few years down the road a student obtaining most of their preclinical basic science education online. Um, but it's going to be extremely difficult online to, um, to duplicate the experience you get in interacting with a patient unless you have virtual reality, um, which actually isn't that far-fetched, I don't think, <laughs> at some point. How about other disciplines? Well, can I, can I take a swing at that one first? I reached out to uh, Jose Bowen, and I said, Jose, what type of course can't be taught via a MOOC? For example, can you learn to play the violin? Or I asked him, can you, can you learn to diagnose pleurisy via a MOOC? And of course, he shot back, can you spell pleurisy, um, which was embarrassing for me. But the fact remains that the answer to the question, what course can't be taught on a MOOC, hasn't been answered yet. And we have to flip that because while you may be right, and I'm not a medical professional, that there may be things that can't be shown effectively without virtual reality. But I would suggest to you that the ability to see a procedure versus read it in a textbook. If I were, you know what I mean? And, and imagine if you were, if you were a medical student, would you rather see it as a video unfolding with commentary from an expert like Dr. Raymond, or would you rather read about it in a textbook and see the pictures of it? I'll tell you where I line up on that one, and I'm, you know, I'm not a doctor in real life, but I play one on TV, yeah. so. Yeah, I think uh, we also, another point I think I'd like to make here is when you look at, um, there's been surveys done by the students that have been uh, in the, in the taking uh, MOOC courses. And the surveys have shown uh, the one of the reasons why only 10% of the students actually complete the courses is because they feel isolated, because they do not have a network around it. And a faculty member that they interact with that actually motivates them to complete the course. And so you know, when you talk about this, there's certain things. Well, I think there, there may be certain disciplines where that may be useful or helpful. You know, and I think about all of us probably can think of in times when they were in college, there was probably a faculty member that changed their lives. They had to help them with something outside of the classroom maybe you were dealing with. That, you know, we had to find a way to capture that that the MOOCs aren't going to do. And maybe that's where we will still fit into the space in terms of other institutions. I would just piggyback uh, briefly on the notion of faculty. Uh, and what a great opportunity that's been expressed to us uh, in administration at Stritch for the faculty to evolve in their skill set, um, to really adapt to the learning models that are preferred out there. So we see it as a great opportunity for our faculty to uh, enhance and expand their skills as well. I'll just speak about my own discipline, which, which was English. And um, I, I taught uh, writing for 25 years at, um, at the secondary level. And I'm just having a hard, tr hard time imagining how you teach writing to 100,000 students. <laughs> Uh, because I think so much of it is that that uh, personal relationship with you when you have uh, when you sit down with a student and you talk about writing and you talk about style and you talk about things that are so individual to the learner. But I'm not willing to say that it can't be done because I think that we're in the infancy of, of seeing the potential of MOOCs. We have 11 minutes left for questions, so I'd like to open it up to the floor, Cynthia. Higher education is a pathway to employment. Might this not be a way to differentiate? And how heavily are you guys, our educators on the panel, involved in connecting an education and a student with employers? Well, um, you talked about trends. You know, it used to be 10 years ago, people would say, you know, am I going to be able to read, write, think, uh, communicate? Um, work in teams, work individually. Now people are saying, what kind of job am I going to get with my college degree? And so, yes, I think uh, we're certainly shifting our activities, uh, the talk about outcomes and what a college degree means. Our obligation, frankly, to the folks of, of 
like you in the room, to prepare students for not only technical and vocational skills, but that broader base as well. So in terms of activities, yes, we're completely engaged uh, in preparing students for the next step, uh, whether it's the world of work, uh, graduate school, or the world of service. Uh, we've, we're asking our faculty to do, uh, I think, much more than teach. It's that notion of advising. The whole comment that I had earlier in terms of my elevator speech, the notion that small is beautiful, to really develop in a holistic sense that student and prepare him or her for what he or she wants to see uh, going forward. You know, I oftentimes you know, say that we're very lucky. You know, we are located in the economic how about the state of Wisconsin? There are 60,000 corporations in the seven uh, county region, and I often say to our students, that's two companies for every one of our students for you to internship with. And as it turns out, we have more than half of our students have formal internships, and so we're very proactive in doing that. But I think even more importantly, you know, we are in the final process, we're just finishing up academic planning on campus, so have come with a new ac academic program array that aligns very, very closely with what the needs are of the region, particularly industry. And, uh, areas that weren't on our radar screen before suddenly are like food and beverage. You know, we're hearing, we're actually, we're, we're always, either my senior leadership or the deans and the university are all involved on, on all, all these boards. Uh, we're getting feedback from companies within the region. I think the way we work with the Water Council, the way we work with the Midwest Energy Research Consortium, we are really trying to align what we do with what we know the workforce and the needs are of the future. Based on information in Forbes magazine, in a survey that they did, 76% of corporations prefer the flipped classroom model. The idea of online learning, in other words, watching videos and then using the, the time in the classroom or the interaction for true interaction, for problem solving skills. So is there a precedent? Is corporate America saying, yes, we want something along these lines? We don't know what something is yet. We're still defining it. But from that standpoint, yes, corporate America does want that. And if you think back, if you flash back to 20, 30 years ago, walking in and saying, I have a Bachelor of Science degree from, fill in the blank with the name of your favorite institution, guess what? That's all, come on in. You're hired. That's, that's not the way that it is today. And my personal experience with this is through the, the presentation that I did for the National Elevator Pitch Championship was about how the letters after your name are not enough in the current economy, and I believe that very strongly. Stella Adler said, you have to have a talent for your talent. It's not enough to simply walk in, quote your name, rank, and serial number, and the name of your favorite institution, and expect that the, that's going to get anything other than maybe a competency test or more questions about your resume. You know, it's, it's a different world, and the knowledge workforce has to be able to create that, that brand value. And that's a burden that's placed on the student who is interviewing, but also, I believe, on, on the institution. I'm curious to know if my, my panelists agree, but you know, does, that, does that answer your question? I think, I think corporate America absolutely is interested in this. They're seeing the value with their own internal programs, as I showed you with Deloitte. And uh, I, I think that we, we, as educators, and I, I consider myself a bit of an educator, although outside of academia, we have to create training that creates value. We have to create learning that is measured for the ultimate goal. Otherwise, students won't see the value either. Does that, does that help? Could I just expand on that a little bit? Because I don't want us to lose sight of the importance of learning outside the classroom uh, in the college experience. So experiences like study abroad, service learning, internships, co-curricular activities. That's where so many students learn leadership skills, working with others. And, and so while I think that um, this is really a fascinating conversation about how you facilitate the learning of content, of skills, of knowledge, there, there's a whole other part to the, to the college experience. I, I just want to just say one more thing real quick about this. I think we all should recognize that higher education in the U.S. is really the crown jewel of our country. People from around the world send their best and brightest here to get trained because we do it better than anyone else. And why is that? It's because we still focus on a strong liberal arts education. And when I meet with leaders of corporations, they tell me they need their, our graduates, their future employees, to have three skills. They need to have written oral communication skills, 
critical thinking, being innovative, and the ability to work in teams. And where do you learn those things? They're in the liberal arts education. So whatever model we come out of here with, with the terms of the MOOCs, we still have to make sure that that is incorporated in what we do. And I think corporate America and the higher ed both agree and understand that. George has been patiently waiting for a while. The economics of this whole situation seem to be very much in flux. What are the right charges? Obviously, there's a cost of preparing all this, and who's going to pay for it? Well, that's, that's really the, the $100 million question. And uh, we were talking uh, beforehand, before we had the panel, you know, um, we were just um, in the social time, about until the financial model actually gets worked out, we're not sure exactly where this is going to end up. And the, 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 um, there has been a lot of venture money. That's what's been driving this. You know, it's, it, the venture money has been driving it, and they all expect a return on their investment. Uh, but no one has figured out, you know, the financial model. And so that's why, you know, I think something like the flex option, which we're offering, which is, you know, we're giving credit, you know, in, in a way that it's on things that are being developed on our campus for competency, is certainly a, a good first step because, you know, we know that that financial model is going to work. We know where we're going to break even. But in terms of the MOOCs and the way we have all this open, I don't think, you know, I'm anxious to hear Chris what he thinks, but I'm not sure that anybody's really figured out you know, who, what's the best way to do this? There, there are a variety of, of financial models that are being explored. Some institutions are even looking at advertising, which may make you cringe and flinch, but, you, you know, if you complete an online course, I mean, we talked about it uh, today in our, in our breakfast, if you complete an online course through Stanford, when you finish, they'll ask you to take a survey to talk about your experience. And when you finish your survey, you know what they send you? A message that lets you know about other courses that they have to offer that might be of interest to you. So... You know, is that is that advertising or is that simply adding value to an experience that you've already shared? I don't know. I, I mean, quite frankly, I don't know that anyone does. But all of these venues are being explored so that the VCs can get their money back and so that professors can get paid to develop and deliver this kind of content. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I wanted to say I actually took the artificial intelligence course that Dr. Thur offered at Stanford, and I'm 56 years old, and I found it to be a very interesting and effective way of learning. Um, but the question I had, and George kind of stole my thunder, thunder a little bit, but I wonder if there's something to be learned from the newspaper model here where the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times can monetize their websites, but nobody else can seem to make money. And I wonder if that's a threat here where if Harvard and... Stanford can make money off of this, but everybody else kind of ends up giving away free content. I don't think so because of what Eileen was saying. There's still going to be that need for an experience, and there's still going to be that need for that, that trusted advisor, that guide, that Sherpa that can help you through, if, if you will. You know, it's, it's a metaphor, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Someone that can help you to understand. Do you like that, Dr. Sherpa? Is that what you're saying at that table back there? All right. <laughs> But you know what I mean, someone that can guide you through the process and that experience is not going away. And you cannot take a guided tour of Italy. Um, I mean, you can, you can watch some great videos, but it's not the same as, as being there. And there will always be, I believe, a need for that experiential element. Now, what's changing is how will that content be curated for, for example, the experience that you had to gain that knowledge of artificial intelligence and then talk about the higher order thinking skills, which is the synthesis and application of those ideas. And I think that that's an experience that will always need to be localized. Um, you know, always might be too strong a word. We'll see what the future holds. But I think that that local connection is, is key. And academic, stu academic institutions aren't going away. MOOCs are simply, it's, it's another option, it's another tool in the toolkit, if, if, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, the conversation has really allowed us, uh, perhaps the four of us on the left, to think more about collaboration uh, and opportunities uh, to bring our special uh, market niche forward and perhaps work together to reach out um, and find additional opportunities. Other questions? I, I actually wanted to ask the audience a question. Uh, I was intrigued by the Deloitte. Um, MOOC, and I wondered in areas where there needs to be lifelong learning with analytical competencies, if there might be roles for companies working together to provide that content. So Mary Ellen, I see you in the audience. How about for Baird? Generally, we find that rather than create it ourselves, look for ways to get the you know, the operating leverage by other people's content. So 
Uh, the number, it's, while you mentioned the Deloitte example, the number of organizations who are offering us pretty high-level content at um, very affordable cost points is, you know, ever-increasing. So, and I think it, at the end of the day, that's my big question mark about with the traditional university system and particularly the issue around tenure, which I know is one of those sacred cows, um, you don't have as much financial flexibility with your workforce as others do. And so, you know, that, I think I'll, I'll end on that, but I think that's one of those big question marks about the financial model. Great. We're supposed to end at 122, and it's 122 now. So I want to thank the panel uh, for a great discussion and thank the audience for your participation. Well, thank you, Dr. Raymond, and thanks, Chris, and thanks to our panelists. Dr. Raymond, I will tell you this. I had the persistence, uh, but obviously I needed MOOCs to get through organic chemistry, or I'd be a doctor now instead of a lawyer. I want to uh, also uh, make sure that everyone is aware that this Friday morning uh, we'll have uh, our breakfast uh, meeting here, uh, and we'll have the mayor, the county executive, chair of the county board, uh, and the president of the city council uh, to uh, talk about the financial uh, budget uh, for our community. So the Insider's Breakfast will be here this Friday. And if you have time, uh, stop uh, Monday, I'm sorry, the 21st. Uh, uh, please stop by uh, as it should be very interesting. Thank you all very much. <laughs>